Penelope's Odyssey, August 5th, 2021. As I write this, I have 10 minutes before I need to walk down the lane. Side note, this is not idle poetic license, reader. There is an actual, physical, honest-to-God lane outside of my door. To the Zen dojo, where I have been sitting in Friday meditations. So, I'm squeezing in this contemplation in a most unzen-like manner. I spent a harried night with anxieties and concerns taking my mind in circles. This seems to have been happening a lot these last few days, and last night the circles seemed to crescendo into a whirlwind of nervous energy. Somewhere in the small hours, I awoke to find myself lying in a pool of sweat. Sweat is purifying, if unpleasant to wake up in. Groggy and saturated, I understood dimly that I had just undergone a massive physical release. It felt like a sign of healing, especially of the kind that comes after a fever. I slept well after that, and deeply. I woke gently this morning to the sound of the morning bells, feeling more rested and refreshed on those few hours of sleep than I had been in all the hours of tossing, turning, and fevered dreams. I rolled out of bed, and am prepared now to proceed sleepily down the lane. Later. I know, reader, that for you this pause has consisted of nothing more than the nanosecond it took for you to skip from the last paragraph to this one. But for me, it had been quite a significant time period. There was, it turns out, something very important waiting for me at that dojo. I sat an hour in silent meditation, facing a wall, and finally looked finally looked with a steady eye at the restless, squirmy, squirrely, frenetic energy that has been storming within me lately. Since starting my meditation practice four years ago, I have made much progress toward dissolving this feeling. But as I sat and watched it, I realized I had never actually named it for what it was. Without a name, it has persisted a vague feeling running underneath the surface of my life subtly defining the quality of my waking consciousness. This morning, I finally gave this energy a name. It is very simple and very relatable. It is, in a word, dissatisfaction. I realize that all my life I have been seeking something. Sometimes it has driven me mad. I am constantly searching, always driven by a combination of doubt and anxiety and curiosity. There is, I know, some potent desire living at the core of me, and a part of me knows I have not found it yet. Perhaps it is here, in France. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. I cannot rest when I know there are other horizons, other mountains, other vistas of experience for me to encounter. This ever-present, unquenchable fire surges through my bones and sends me again and again in search of my limits, come hell, high water, pain, and once, the face of death. As I sat this morning, I understood something. I realized that I seem to hold two fundamental archetypes at the center of my being that are asking now to be brought somehow into harmony. One is Odysseus, the seeker, the adventurer, the one who lives by his wits and longs only to come home at last. The other is Penelope, the homebound queen, the clever weaver, the one left behind. When I was younger, I really hated Odysseus. I hated that he left Ithaca without ensuring that his kingdom would be safe and guarded. I hated him for having adventures while his wife sat at home, perpetually weaving and unweaving that damnable shroud. I hated Odysseus for his haplessness when he returned. I hated that he received credit as protagonist of the story, when it seemed to me that Penelope was actually the mastermind behind the whole plot. Most of all, I hated that, after the twenty long years of yearning and crying out and gnashing his teeth, of volubly longing for home, as soon as he returned and, through the timely interventions of the women in his life, set his kingdom in order, the unbelievable oaf packed his bags and set off again. Who is this guy? I thought indignantly. What the hell does he even want? Alas, reader, he is me. And so too is Penelope. I understand Odysseus far too well. 
I understand the persistent, unbearable tension between craving to seek, discover, conquer, to travel to lands unseen, to know those places, even as it clashes with an earnest desire to remain seated firmly at home on the throne in the center of my kingdom. So how does one reconcile these two seemingly opposite archetypes who have for so long been in conflict within me? As Rilke would so luminously advise, this is the question I must choose to live now. I can't, as I have learned the hard way, simply kill Odysseus and cast him from the kingdom of my being. His restless, cunning, resourceful trickster self, his full-bodied craving for adventure and discovery, is an indelible part of me. In the shadow aspect, the power of this archetype is dark, dangerous, restless, and wearying. When he is suppressed or rejected, he brings only anxiety, discontent, and destructive impulsiveness. In the light, however, the driving energy of Odysseus weaves a legacy of mythic proportions. But this need for wide, epic experiences can unbalance me. In its grip, I lose my center. I can journey too far from home to the point where I no longer know what it is. I forget in which direction it lies, or, as I feel now, despair that I even have one. When I'm overtaken by the storm of Odysseus, I become impatient for grandiosity, and I forget to cherish the small, lovely, peaceful steps that I am taking. I become so focused on doing and seeking that I forget that there is really nowhere to get to, nothing to achieve, and nothing to prove. Penelope, then, is my strong, rooted counterpoint. And I realized today, as I sat facing the blank wall of a tiny Zen monastery in the exact center of rural France, that there is a part of me that actually fears to embrace her. Poor Penelope, who stayed at home to hold down the kingdom while Odysseus went off on his grand adventures. She, it seemed to me, did all of the hard work, coolly masterminding the running of Ithaca, providing the impetus to move the plot forward, subtly offering resolutions for seemingly intractable problems, and on top of it all, dealing with an oafish husband who came blundering into a situation that, despite the narrator's grim premonitions of doom and gloom, she seemed to have well in hand, thank you very much. It has taken me years to realize that Penelope was completely, utterly, and entirely content in her behind-the-scenes role. She is the smug smile of satisfaction, the invisible hand spinning the central mechanism. She is the woman, so to speak, behind the curtain. And finally, she is the other aspect of self, the counterpoint to my Odysseus that I'm coming to terms with. And what a confrontation it is. Because what arose within me very clearly this morning is that I actually fear contentment. Who would I be, I wonder? If I'm not constantly seeking, achieving, discovering, who would I be if I'm not the blustering protagonist of my own life, the visible mistress of my creations? How could I be content behind the curtain, invisible, unnoticed, uncredited, unseen? I understand now that there is a part of me, very deep down, that equates contentment with stagnation. This fear is the unconscious saboteur that prevents me from finding home. What if, in embracing contentment, I lose my drive, my energy, my calling, my adventures? Contentment, in my subconscious, is coupled with a type of soul-wrenching compromise. According to these deep-seated fears, if I choose contentment, I will settle for something less than I deserve, something less than I truly am. This realization has come upon me like a gift. Now that I see it, I can dissolve these fears which had for so long driven me just below the surface. I'm frankly exhausted with relying on dissatisfaction to drive me impulsively and recklessly into my adventures. I would prefer to undertake my adventures with my feet underneath me, with a map in hand, and with my needs provided for. I would prefer to know always where my center is and, at all times, how to find my way back. I am learning that the choice to come home, wherever, whatever, and whenever that is, invites me not to give up, but to surrender. My fears clamor at me, making it seem like this specific act of surrender will be the hardest and most poignant. 
But after so much practice, I'm learning that all surrender is ultimately the same. It must, however, be done cleanly. Otherwise, it is not surrender, but rejection, a casting away. And if you've ever cast anything, notably a fishing line, you will see that you are still indelibly attached to it. This was the realization that dawned in the humble dojo down the lane. This was the fever that broke last night, a fever of so many years of seeking. This truth now calls me to a whole new level of mastery. I'm being asked now not to conquer this Ulysses, but to hold, direct, and channel him with the force of my immortal presence. I am calling my inner Odysseus into devotion of a new cause, not the rigors of war and restless seafaring, but in service to the home, the hearth, in service to love and to contentment itself. I bring him into humble service to a purpose, not through resistance, but through generation, creativity, and protection. I'm becoming ready to surrender my driving, courageous, adventurous spirit into the service of something larger and more fulfilling than my personal will. In this surrender, Odysseus can take his rightful place as king within me, not as the energy that I lead with, but as a slow, unwavering fire at the center of my being. This is not the fire of fever, but the gentle blaze of the hearth. It warms me and guides me along my path, step by ecstatic step, back home.